baseball bat, was it? Or a hammer or something. It was a pipe. Of course. The lead pipe in the train compartment. Guilty on both counts. Death penalty recommended and imposed. Pretty rough for your first case. Here's another one from 86. State versus Wolf and Wolf. You rejected the plea. Two brothers shot their grandmother because she wouldn't let them borrow her car. <laughs> A solid career for just eight years on the bench. It's my guess that you will have the quickest confirmation hearing in the history of the goddamn state Supreme Court. Thanks, John. I know you had a lot to do with it. Damn right. I told the governor that I'd be writing opinions for my deathbed if he didn't nominate you. So I was rammed down his throat. Judge Fallon, the materials you requested are here. Gwen, there isn't any room for you in the governor's throat. <laughs> Did anybody tell you that there's a dress code for the clerks in my office? I'm not a clerk, Your Honor. I work at the library. If you show up here again like that, it'll be your last day. Understand? Yes, Your Honor. These cases caused us the most commotion and controversy over the past 30 years. Do your homework, because they're the things that are most likely to come up at your confirmation hearing. Thanks, John. Will the defendant please rise? The prosecution led by Mr. Mayron has presented your prior record and has pushed hard for the maximum penalty allowed by this state? That's correct, Your Honor. Based on Mr. Mayron's request, I hereby sentence you, Paul Michael Ramirez, for the robbery and murder of Willie Bunton to life in prison without the possibility of parole. You think you can hide from me? I'll kill you, man! I'll kill you! You think I can't get to you? Someone should tell him there's a long waiting line for that. I specifically asked you for leniency based on my client's difficult upbringing. Your client killed an unarmed store owner for $65. He's a 26-year-old kid who grew up on the streets with no parents. You want to champion the cause of the have-nots? Start with the two kids in Willie Bunton's house who've been waiting for their father to come home from his store since last July. This is justice, Teresa. It's not politics. I confirmed lunch on Friday, and Dan Llewellyn called to say congratulations and that he would see you at the reception for Judge Pollan. I need you to sign this. And Tom called about your meeting on Monday. And these came. They're gorgeous. Well, you can borrow them anytime you want. Thanks. <laughs> Who's this? New boyfriend? <laughs> no, that's an old picture. Just another in a series of cheap and meaningless physical encounters. Yeah, I guess third year law hasn't changed all that much, huh? Your Honor. Your Honor. They condemn order for Redmond Arms. Did you get it? Sorry, Tony. Curtis wouldn't sign the order. I know this. However, I no. also know... I can't do it, Tony. I can't issue an injunction without a police order. Last time, he almost got me disbarred. You two can't touch you now. Besides, this is Redmond Arms we're talking about. It's a damn crack in the box, and they got kids living there. You're certain of that? You want to take a tour? You know, even if I agreed to do it, it wouldn't happen overnight. I'd have to request the proper injunction form, so I could take weeks. I want you to know, I am gonna take you to lunch this time. Promise.
what time we have to leave? Whenever you're ready. You really feel like doing this? Gwen. Mike. I'm going to get us a drink. Congratulations. Oh, well, well, we'll see. <laughs> have you met my wife, Sheila? No, I don't think so, Sheila. Nice to meet you, too. <laughs> well, you look disappointed. I'm looking for Alan. I'd be willing to pretend. <clears throat> Subtlety never was your strong point. You mean my overt attempts to take you to bed? <laughs> it's part of it. <laughs> Feed the old rumor mill. Oh, you know what? What? You look uh, sensational. And I mean that. <laughs> you do. <laughs> say something nice about my experience on the state bench for the last 30 years. As soon as something occurs to me, I'll let you know. <laughs> Seriously, though, I do hope the next 30 years will be as rewarding for our next state justice, Gwen Warwick. <laughs> All the best to you, Gwen. Review volume 90, number 8, volume 88, number 5, please. Be right back. for a man barely five feet tall, don't you think? My favorite Catholic hunchback. Hey, you're a fan of Mr. Poe. College thesis. Really? Let's take this. There you go. And step it there. Thanks. There you go. Sure you don't want to check this out as well? Oh, I wish I had the time.
Thank you. Hello there. Hi. Yeah, the law journals, they looked a bit dry. <laughs> a bit. So you're an attorney? Judge, circuit court. Really? You're surprised. No, I just, I guess, I imagine judges had people who did their research for them. Oh, yes. Yes, it's a commonly held myth, advanced by politicians and law professors. Yeah, you're also, um, well, just not the way I pictured a judge to look. Well, we don't all look like Judge Wapner. I don't know him. Does he come in here also? No, he's... Never mind. Okay, here you go. Thanks. Your Honor. Lieutenant. You know, you're probably a lot smarter than I am. How so? Well, I mean, we're both in the same racket, law enforcement. But you're too smart to get bogged down in the everyday bullshit, like uh, this injunction for the condemn order. Now, I suppose you think you have the right to go over my head because the police department is too stupid to cut through its own red tape. Redmond Arms has been ripe for condemned for two years, Lieutenant. Detective Canfield found out. Canfield, kids Canfield doesn't even have the authority to request this condemn order, much less ask you to sign it. Did it ever occur to you that your arrogance might have blown the cover on an investigation that Canfield didn't know anything about? I don't know why you keep going over my head. Is it because you think you know better than me? Or is it feed your ego? I don't know what your story is. But the next time you interfere with my business, I'll have you brought up on contempt charges. And that is a promise, Your Honor. Thank you, that's very nice. Thank you, sir.
get cold. You want to come inside? No. Want me to walk you back? No. Then what, what are you doing here? I don't know. Come on. At the turn of the century, this place was a glove factory. Now they're lucky if they can rent it out for storage. So, is this approach usually effective? What approach is this? The business with the poems. Have you had luck with it before? You mean, do I have a lot of women following me back here? I'm afraid you're the first. Have you lived down here long? There's a juvenile center down. Down here, I got into a little trouble after my father died. Did you go to City College? No. You well, obviously went somewhere. Because I read. I didn't mean it like that. This was interrogation. I was curious. Suspicious? Yeah, suspicious. Actually, I, um... came here to bring you this. to go. I shouldn't have come.
We got back early. That's great. How'd it go? Could have gone better. Where you been, Gwen? What? Tonight. Oh, I was at the library. Hmm. Well, I'm beat. These just came for you. From Tony Canfield? He said he was sorry about the blow-up with Lieutenant Cardis. Well, that was sweet of him. Oh, and a guy called from the University of Michigan. He said he found the article you were looking for. What article? I don't know. The number's on there. Just missed her. She's at the library. The library. Mm -hmm. Listen, I need to use her telephone. Sure. Go ahead. Thanks. Listen, I just came to tell you that what happened here last night should not have happened. We don't know each other. I don't know you. I don't know anything about you. I mean, how old are you? You don't know me. You know nothing about me. Did you know I was married? Look, it's not going to happen again. That's all. I just wanted to make that clear. Okay. Want a beer? Did you hear me? Yeah, we're not going to sleep together anymore. That's right. Oh, uh, you want a beer? No. Just getting some air. You need a lift? No, I think I'll walk. Come on, get in here. It's gonna rain. Come on.
Hello? Mrs. Warwick, it's Ed at the gate. There's a Mr. Mayron here to see you. Oh, sure. Um, send him back. Will do. Hey. Charles, what's going on? Hey. Uh, sorry, uh, for dropping by like this, but I was driving back to the office, and I, uh, I wanted to see you. Oh, and I keep forgetting to give you this. And it's heavy. <laughs> oh, Very heavy. It is heavy. Well, come in. Thanks. In honor of your nomination. Oh, Charles, that's beautiful. <laughs> yes. What oh, sweet thing. I'm proud of you, Gwen. Thanks, it means a lot to me. Now, listen to me. I know it's not my place, but lately, I've been thinking a lot about you. Here, all these nights. It's not gonna happen, Charles. I know. I know. <laughs> but, um, I am working late, though, if you change your mind. Huh? Visit? Charles, he was dropping something off. Is this what he was dropping off? Yes. Why don't you take it? Hmm. Just take it. Huh? Take it. Gwen. Take the gavel, huh? Did you fuck him, Gwen, huh? Did you fuck him in our house here, huh? Come here for a second. Come here for a second. Where are you going? Hey, come here. You're not going anywhere. Let go of me. <laughs> Let go of me. Let me talk to you for a second, okay? Hey, hey! Hey, don't you walk away from me! You hear me? Hey! You walk away right now? I swear to God, I'll ruin you.
sorry. This must seem so absurd to you. I don't know why I even came here. You think he might try to hurt you? Oh. Someone killed him last night. What? I'm sorry. What? Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. 
Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Charles Mayron gave this community and this parish a rich life. Hear our prayers, Lord, when we ask for the strength to carry on in his absence. Lord, have mercy on his soul. May he rest in peace. I understand they arrested someone. Yes, they arrested a woman named Andrea Tobias. Evidently, she and Charles have been having an affair for the past six months. She was seen leaving his office the night of the murder. I'm all right. I'm all right. How's the homework doing? Pretty good, I guess. What have I got before we get together? About two weeks? About that, I'd say. Now, look, Gwen. I need a favor. A problem has come up in the Mayron trial, and we need someone to hear it. I thought that was moved to Grant County with Sidney Lazar. Oh, it was, it was, but now he's claiming he's too sick to do it. What is he, 62? He could be my son, for Christ's sake, anyway. The upshot is, I'd like you to take it. I can't do that, John. Charles and I worked together. We were friends. Mayron was friends with every judge in the county. Or thought he was, anyway. But what do you say? I promise, I promise it won't interfere with your confirmation hearings. Oh. John, I feel badly. I just can't do it. When? You're my last resort. We've tried to change the venue four times already. You know the pressures that we'll be under if it's pushed back six months. Oh, I'm sorry, John. I wish I could help you. Gwen, I'm appealing to you as a friend. I've never asked you for anything. I really need this. John, you know I'd do anything for you. Let me, um, think. Uh, um... I guess if you're really in a bind, huh? Good. Thank you. I'll have Gil Cummins call you in the morning. Now, you know Gil, don't you? Gil. Yes, um... Yes, I met Gil at, um... at the reception for Steinbach. Right, right. Let me know if you don't hear from him. Yes, of course. Thanks, John. What's her name? Themis, goddess of justice. She's blindfolded. She's blind to everything except the weight of the facts before her. See, if she's asked to balance two objects, she shouldn't be able to see that one is a feather and one is a stone, in case the stone is lighter. Mm. So you don't find this difficult? Standing in judgment over people you don't really know? Yes, it is. It's more difficult at first. You know, there was a lot of resentment when I was appointed. The conventional wisdom of the time being that I was too young and too soft. And then a lot of people thought I got the job because I was sleeping with Charles Mayron, who I happened to be working for at the time. And uh, just couldn't wait to see me tested. So my first really big trial was a quite a high-profile murder case that nobody else wanted. And the defendant had murdered his ex-wife and her new husband in a compartment of a moving train. And I imposed the death penalty. Was it carried out? 
Yes, it was carried out. And I had nightmares about it for months afterwards. About the day that I handed down a sentence walking up the courthouse steps with reporters yelling at me from their umbrellas. But after that, no one ever accused me of being soft. I guess it is sad that it seems almost routine now. Uh, there was a bleeding heart in there somewhere. These are the preliminary motions for the Mayron case. Why do you have them? I'm representing the defendant, Andrea Tobias. Don't expect to ask for the leniencies you filed in the Ramirez case. I won't need to, because you didn't do it. difficult part of a prosecutor's job is hearing the same story over and over again from very sincere attorneys describing their defendant. He's such an ordinary guy, they say. She's such an ordinary person. Well, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, ordinary people have sides to them that many of us will never know. Sides that have affairs. Sides that commit murder. And I submit to you that Andrea Tobias has a side that did both. The state will prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Mrs. Tobias, a married woman, distraught over Mr. Mayron's desire to end their affair, went to his office on the evening of October 6th for the sole purpose of killing him. And with a blunt object, she struck him repeatedly on the head, crushing his skull. Ms. Lewis? The prosecution is presenting a case against Andrea Tobias based purely on circumstantial evidence. Yes, Ms. Tobias was having a relationship with Charles Mayron. She will admit that on the stand. But no, she was not in his office that night. And no, she did not kill him. Now, as Mr. Clarkson presents his evidence in this trial, I want you to be on the lookout for the one piece of evidence which could prove with certainty who killed Charles Mayron. The murder weapon. Now, watch very closely, because Mr. Clarkson doesn't have this mallet, this hammer, this blunt object. Because if he did, I could prove to you right now what he already knows. He has the wrong person. Your Honor, Tony Canfield. Hi, Tony. What's up? Look, I'm sorry to bother you at home, but I just saw something here that um doesn't quite work for me. Thought I'd talk to you about it. Sure, should. The night of the murder, did you make any calls to Mayron's home or office? No. What about your husband? I doubt it. Why? Well, I just got the sheet back with all of Marin's calls. It says here there was a two-second phone call made from your house to Marin's house. Just after midnight. Then, eight seconds later, there's another call from your house to Marin's office. Yanni, you there? Yeah, I was just thinking um, that Alan probably I mean, it's possible that he called Charles after I went to bed. Okay. I'm sorry to bother you. Tell Alan I may have to speak with him to follow up, okay? Oh, sure. No problem. Thanks, Tony. Good night. Good night.
are you doing here? I've been thinking about you a lot these last few weeks, and um, I missed you. I know that a lot has happened. And I've done things which I regret. Things got out of hand. I need you. And you need me. Listen, let me just start all over. It's just you and me now. This isn't a good time. Hey, I can just, I can fix everything. Gwen, don't do this to me. Don't do this to yourself. I'm sorry. Remember that I came for you. Just remember that. Because I'm never coming back. You're on your own. Mr. Noel, as chief forensics expert, what evidence was there to suggest that someone else was present on the night of the murder? Well, we found an article of clothing and other items which indicated a woman had been in his office that night. Were you able to lift fingerprints from the murder scene? Yes, we were. Did any of those fingerprints match those of the defendant, Andrea Tobias? Yes, they did. No further questions, Your Honor. Your witness. Mr. Noel, if anyone else's fingerprints found at the scene of crime? Yes, there were a few. And to whom did they belong? Well, some were never identified. Others belonged to people who worked here in this building. Such as? Well, Mr. Mehran's secretary, of course, and his clerk, and yours, I believe, and uh, Her Honor's. Her Honor's? Yes. Well, then. Mr. Noel, if the presence of fingerprints at the scene of the crime is what this trial is based on, I should be sitting at that defendant's table, or her honor, or anyone in this city who's been in Charles Mayron's office in the past several months. Objection, counsel, is speech making. Sustained, Ms. Lewis. Your Honor, I draw the court's attention to a piece of evidence marked exhibit C, the earring found at the crime scene. Noel, is there any indication, any indication whatsoever, that the earring in this bag belongs to Andrea Tobias? Well, there are traces of fingerprints on the surface of the earring, but as yet the tests have been inconclusive. Please answer the question, Mr. Noel. Is there any factual indication that either this earring or the pair of women's underwear found under Charles Mayron's sofa belongs to Andrea Tobias? No, not as yet, no. In point of fact, Mr. Noel, this is the most recently gathered evidence, evidence which I will present in this courtroom, suggests that an entirely different woman came to see Charles Mayron on the night he was murdered. Your Honor, objection. Sustained. Withdrawn. Nothing! I'm being set up. What? Planted my things at the crime scene. Jesus. It's Alan. I can't believe you do this. 
It's what he meant when he said that he'd done things he wished he could take back. That I needed him now. Yeah. But you were here that night. With me. Illicit lovers don't make the best witnesses. No. If this ever went to trial, I'd be eaten alive. Prosecution calls Abe Gleason to the stand. Mr. Gleason, could you describe for us what you saw take place on that particular evening? Well, just as I started down the stairs from three, I saw this woman go into Mr. Mehran's office. Could you describe that woman for us? She was young, maybe 30 or 40 years old, uh, dark hair, and a long black coat. Is that woman here in this courtroom, Mr. Gleason? I believe that's her right there. Let the record show that Mr. Gleason pointed to the defendant, Andrea Tobias. Thank you, Mr. Gleason. No further questions. I believe that's her right there. Those are your exact words, Mr. Gleason. I believe that's her. What exactly do you mean by that? Well, he, he asked me who I thought it was, and I said I thought it was this woman right here. So you, you think it was her? Yes, ma'am. But you don't know. Well, like I told the police, if it wasn't her, it was sure somebody who looked like her. Oh, really? Objection. Counsel is badgering the witness. Overruled. So the woman you saw was either the defendant or someone who looks like the defendant, which, according to your description, is someone around 30 or 40 with dark hair and a long coat. 30, 40, dark hair and long coat? That's right. That's all, Mr. Gleason. And the scarf. Excuse me? She was wearing a red scarf. I don't recall you mentioning anything about a scarf before. Well, nobody asked me. Was she wearing it around her neck or over her head? She was wearing it up over her head. Like a church bonnet. Mr. Gleason, this is the scarf I wore to work today. Then this was the view of the woman's face that allowed you to positively identify her as Miss Tobias from a stairwell of some 40 feet away. But yes, ma'am. No further questions. Your Honor, Judge Pollen on one. John, hi, what can I do for you? Gwen, I need your feedback on something. I just found out who's getting your bench after you move to the state court. Really? Who's that? Teresa Lewis. From what I hear, it sounds like she's putting on a real show in there. Yes, she certainly is. So you don't have a problem with my giving her an endorsement? No, that's fine. Very well, then. Thanks, Gwen. What are you doing, Gwen? I had a headache. Mm -hmm. 
So tell me, Mr. Walcott, at what angle were the blows to the victim inflicted? Approximately 70 degrees, which led us to believe that the assailant was several inches shorter than the victim, who stood 5 foot 11. Several inches shorter. Let the record show that the defendant is exactly 5 foot 6 inches tall. No further questions, Your Honor? Court will recess until 1 o'clock Monday. Stacy? Stacy? This message from the guy at Michigan, did he say what it was regarding? Uh, no. Uh, something about an article you had written for a college poetry journal? Library? Yes, Lee Walters, please. Speaking. Yes, this is Judge Warwick, returning your call. Oh, yes. Uh, I was calling because I managed to locate another copy of the 75 Poetry Journal. That's if you're still looking for copies of your old articles. My old articles? In addition to the one I gave your assistant when he was here. The one on Alexander Pope? When was this? Uh, last June, according to my sheet. He said you wanted them for a collection or something. What did he look like? Oh, I don't know. Uh, 25 or so, dark hair. Do you still want me to send them? No. No, that won't be necessary. This guy, what's his name? I don't remember. Did he tell you his name? Uh, Alex. Alex something. He, he said he was a clerk for Judge McGowan. And you only saw him this once? Uh, yes. You haven't seen him since? <sighs> no. Did you go to his apartment? No. We were at Malone's across the street. And then we came here. Did he ask questions about me? I don't know. Thanks, Stacy. What did you talk about? What did you talk about? Did you talk about Charles Mayron? Did he ask about Mayron and me? About the rumors? He might have. Thanks, no, Stacy. No. Did you tell him about the rumors? I don't normally gossip. I... Lieutenant, it's Judge Warwick. I need you to get somebody to the corner of Cass and Howard right away. There's a warehouse building on the corner on the second floor. Damn it, Lieutenant, help me out here. I'll explain when I get there. What's this all about? I'm sorry, I made a mistake. shell fourth from the bottom
I don't remember his name. You still have his lease? There's no lease. Cash up front each month. So you don't have a job application for him? Social security number or anything? Not for a volunteer. State versus Sloan. That's certain to come up during your confirmation hearings. Well, I would have voted to overturn it. I can back it up with an argument. I'm called upon to do so. <laughs> Very well. You're going to do all right. So, is that the last of them? Pretty much, yes. Um, except for one case that I've been reviewing for a couple of weeks now that I... I don't know how I would respond. What kind of case is it? Murder. Indiana case. Involving a cop who claims he was framed, but doesn't know the name of the person who's framing him, or why. And he came forward to the police as soon as he realized he was being set up. Maine versus Edmonds. Uh, Greer. New York versus Greer. Texas versus Adams. No, those aren't really the same. In each of those cases, the defendant knew the person who was setting them up, and why. In this case, the cop doesn't know the real name of the person who's framing him. And, in fact, can't prove that the guy exists. Well, premeditated framing cases are pretty rare. Because they take too damn much thought. How strong was the evidence? Circumstantial, but strong. <laughs> Here you go. Rota versus Gaddis. IBM salesman charged with killing his mistress. The guy claimed his wife framed him to get back at the two of them. Well, that's not the same either. The wife's motive was clear. The wife was dead. Drowned in a boating accident six months before the murder. Let me guess. They never found the body. Yep. The husband claimed she faked her death so that she could frame him later. What happened? The defense had no one to blame. They had no case. The guy had a clean record, but he got life. Excuse me. I want you to go down and pull every one of my cases where the defendant was found guilty. Well, that could take days. I want them tomorrow. Look, a poetry was found open next to the body of Charles Mayron on the night of the murder. As Mr. Mayron's law clerk, you interacted with him on a daily basis, correct? Yes, that's correct. Did you ever see this book before the night of the murder? No. Was Charles Mayron a man who was fond of reading poetry? That I knew of. Was Charles Mayron the kind of man who generally saw one woman on an exclusive basis? Was Charles Mayron involved in any other relationships that you were aware of? I've heard things. In your opinion, do you think it's possible, even likely, that someone other than a defendant could have brought that up to meet Mayron and I was murdered? Yes, I say it's possible. Your Honor, no further questions. Surprise. Your Honor. I want to ask you a few questions. Have a seat.
How well did you know Charles Mayra? Pretty well, I suppose. I started my career with him in the prosecutor's office. Were you aware of his uh, relationship with Andrea Tobias? Not until her arrest, no. Were you aware of his relationships with any other women? No. You sure of that? Charles Mayron was a chronic flirt, Lieutenant. There were rumors linking him with every woman in the Detroit legal community. Including yourself? Yes. Were you having an affair with Charles Mayron at the time of his murder? No. You uh, sure of that? Lieutenant. One more question, Your Honor. What did you major in college? Poetic literature. Huh. So many to make time for, the inscription reads. Mr. Wetton, you've done a complete handwriting analysis on the inscription in this book. That's correct. And based on this analysis, what does the handwriting style indicate about the person who wrote it? The looping motion indicates a confident, dominant person, most likely a woman. Someone who's in a position of power, like an executive or an administrator. Objection. The witness is not a psychic. Your Honor. Objection. Sorry. Objection sustained. In your opinion, Mr. Wetton, is this handwriting at all similar to that of the defendant? This is an enlarged copy of the inscription. And this is Mrs. Tobias's handwriting. In my opinion, there is no way that inscription could have been written by Miss Tobias. That inscription must have been written by another woman. No further questions, Your Honor. Court will recess until 8.30 Thursday morning. Your Honor, this authorization form just came in to add Doug Wetton to our witness list. It has to be signed, of course. Ms. Lewis, can I see you? Sure, I'll be right with you. Thanks. trial of Andrea Tobias, there is a new development, and it is not here at the courthouse. Police today started looking for a second woman. A woman, police say, was in the office of prosecuting attorney Charles Bayron the night of his murder. How that woman or this investigation will affect the trial is not yet known. More details on the news at 11. Turning to national news, the second... you, Gwen. I know it was. You don't know what you're talking about. You were here that night. So were you. Yes. Yes. 
We both were. I'm sorry. Jesus Christ. I have to talk with you. Some weird things have been coming down, Your Honor. I thought you should know about them. A couple of days ago, we got a call from somebody in Cardis's office requesting a file on you. No one would tell me what it was about, but I could tell by the way it was requested. It just wasn't right. And yesterday, somebody down here met this old woman who claimed she was almost run over by a car just after the time of the murder. It was a Cadillac, a black one. And I remembered this thing with the phone records. Calls were made from your house exactly 30 minutes before the janitor saw the woman in the mayman's office. I made that drive this morning. 27 minutes, 16 seconds. What are you saying? I'm not saying anything. Just that this whole damn thing has become real secretive all of a sudden. Nobody's talking to me about it. I just wanted you to know. of evidence brought before this court, particularly the refuted testimony of the prosecution's key witness, Mr. Gleason, I hereby declare a mistrial in the matter of State versus Tobias. It is quite clear, Ms. Tobias, that the charges brought against you in these proceedings were unfounded and should never have taken place. The court is truly sorry for any embarrassment that this may have caused you. You are free to go. Court is now adjourned. May I come in? I can understand if, if this is something that you don't want to tell me about. A guy from my study group just called. He's the clerk for an assistant in the prosecutor's office. He was just asked to type up an arrest warrant. It was for you. I told him that obviously there was some kind of a mistake, but he insisted it was going to be served. Tomorrow. Your Honor? Your Honor?
disappointed in you, Gwen. I never imagined it would take you this long. Don't hurt me. Hurt you? You think I came here to hurt you? I could have killed you a hundred different times. to lie awake in bed, thinking of all the things that could go wrong. But the whole thing was so simple, was so easy. Are you wearing this, Gwen? Are you wearing this? And you looked my father in the eyes, and you ordered his death. And you proved to them that you weren't soft. You're hurting me. I can't hurt you, Gwen. Because you don't know pain. Pain is being caged like an animal with nothing to do but count the days until your death. And you'll know pain, Gwen. When you only have time. Count the days till your death. Your father killed your mother. What about her pain? Her mother was a whore. She deserved to die. A whore, just like you. You liked it so much, didn't you? <gasps> perfectly calculated. Getting to my house, making the phone calls, getting down to the courthouse, back to the loft in time. Every second was accounted for. I was tailor-made for him. Do you have anything that belongs to him? Anything that could prove you spent any time together? There were a couple of notes. I didn't keep them. Well, I don't have to tell you what's going to happen. You can tell the whole world that you were set up and that this guy had the perfect motive. If that gavel turns up with your fingerprints on it, I don't know what to say. Call Carter, get it over with. Hey, look, Martin knows damn well if he was somehow to find that gavel before the cops did, there'd be no case. Now, why wouldn't he have? Planted it at the murder scene. You would have been arrested the next day. That would have been too painless. He wanted to watch me as the noose got tighter and tighter. Then he has to still be watching to see if you do find it before the police. He can't let you destroy it and walk away clean. He just search your office. What about the house? <laughs>
back, Gwen. 